Hey folks! So the end of the year is coming up and I started looking back at the projects I'd done this year and projects I'd worked on in the past that hadn't made it to the channel and realized I had quite a few built up that I had forgotten about or hadn't worked out for some reason and I thought it would just be fun to do a quick overview of kind of all my failed and forgotten projects over the last couple of years of running this channel. One of the reasons I started this channel was to keep myself honest. I'm sure a lot of you can commiserate Starting projects is a lot of fun. Finishing them through sometimes isn't as much fun. And so this channel really helps me personally push through kind of the last bit of a project and get it published and finish it. But that doesn't mean <laughs> I finish most of my projects. In fact, a lot of them never see the light of day because they just, for one reason or another, don't get done. There's time codes down at the bottom if you want to skip around to different sections. Some of these projects are still very interesting to me, so I'll probably work on them in the future. If there's a particular project or idea that you find interesting, let me know in the comments down below and maybe I'll bump that up in the priority list. So this first project, I informally called it the VAST project, Very Affordable Survey Telescope. And for a long time, I had this idea of making just a really cheap multi-aperture telescope using combinations of like 3D printing and aluminum extrusions. The main mechanism was built around this flexure rolling joint that I saw in a NASA paper. My idea is that you have a ball screw or some other kind of linear actuator which rolls across these flexible bands. And the main advantage of this system is that you can convert a relatively long linear distance into a small angular distance. So you get pretty high precision for relatively cheap components. And the idea is that it would use a bunch of individual apertures and individual cameras and kind of stack all the images together, just like the Dragonfly telescope array. The next project was a nanodiamond project. Here I found a paper that allowed you to directly write nanodiamonds. You apply graphite to a glass slide and put another glass slide on top of it. Then you hit it with a pulsed laser. And when the laser pulses ablate the graphite, there's essentially nowhere for the plasma plume to go. And so it's forced and contained in a relatively small area. And that high pressure shock wave can generate nano diamonds. The plain graphite has a very characteristic look under the AFM and as you kind of increase power it starts to take on a different morphology until you get to a point which I think are nano diamonds. You can't actually quantify nano diamonds just by morphology alone. This is something you need like a micro Raman spectrometer or a x-ray something or other to get kind of crystallography to really confirm it. I was really interested in electrochemical machining for a long time. You can see one of my early experiments here where I have this is a 3D printed jig that has a small wire running underneath the jig and it's connected up to a power source. And this is running an electrochemical process. It's kind of like electroplating, but in reverse. I even got to the point where I was building out a much larger power supply. And actually the Cartesian T-Bot video from way, way long ago was meant to be used as a wire ECM device. That's why I was building it. This never happened and probably won't. When I was going through my electroplating phase, there's a lot of literature on pulse electroplating. Standard electroplating just uses a regular DC current, but there's a lot of variation. So one of the really common ones is pulse plating. Generate pulses and the on and off time kind of affect the electrolyte solution differently and you can get better results. Some variations will actually reverse the pulse so you get a little bit of an AC style waveform and that can also help with more tricky materials. I've always been interested in additive manufacturing for ceramics and over a long time I was playing around with adding different ceramics, mostly aluminum oxide, to off the shelf SLA resin. If you can get a high enough loading of aluminum oxide into this resin, you can print with it and then sinter and bind it together to make a, a ceramic part. There's some chemistry involved because you need to keep the aluminum oxide in suspension. So you can see in this image, the plain resin on the right just doesn't keep alumina. But if you play around with charge potentials and pH like on the left, you can actually keep the aluminum oxide pretty well suspended. If I remember correctly, I was using citric acid on the left. But this is a really big, dark, deep rabbit hole. You need to get a high enough loading of the ceramic and then you also need all your burnout and sintering schedule to be perfect or else you just get kind of an oxidized mess like you see here. Around the time that I got my fiber laser, I started basically just shooting everything with a fiber laser. 
And one of the more interesting experiments I ran into was sintering silicon carbide. So there's nothing overly scientific about this. I just laid out a relatively thin layer and hit it with different test patterns on the fiber laser. And surprisingly, you can get the silicon carbide to sinter to itself pretty well. This was before I had my SEM, so I can't actually quantify you know, how well the particle sintered. I suspect there's a lot of nuance to getting this to work well, but there is some literature about laser centered silicon carbide. <laughs> The microthruster project, man, I've spent so much time on this over the last couple years. You can basically think of it as a tiny rocket. So there's a solid propellant, usually like black powder or something, inside of a micro machine cavity that has a nozzle-ish shape. And then you use some type of like resistor or heating device to set off the charge. And it provides a very small bit of impulse. I tried a lot of different methods and over time they became more sophisticated as I got better or more equipment. But essentially I was trying to make different electrical traces on a glass slide using either graphite or copper tape and then placing a micro machine cavity on top of it that could contain the propellant. The cavity was created using laser induced backside etching. It's similar to the wet etching that I showed in a different video. You're ablating a piece of metal and the plasma explosion from that metal etches a little bit of the glass and will generate a cavity for you. At some point I got my sputter coating machine and so I was able to lay down a thin film and then ablate away patterns on the thin film, which was a little more elegant than the copper tape that I was using previously. Still haven't gotten this to work. It'd be kind of cool to get it to work someday, so I don't know, might revisit this one. It's funny, you can kind of see the chronology of the channel here. I had been working on these little micro machine cavities but had no way to measure them. And so that's why I started working on the DIY confocal. So it's just a little behind the scenes of what's driving some of these different projects. One of the ways I was analyzing these at the time was using focus stacking. And this is a technique where you take lots of individual photos at different Z heights. Microscope objectives have a very thin depth of field. So each kind of Z slice is a very thin slice through the thing you're looking at. If you take enough of these Z heights and stack them all together, there's software that will generate a 3D image for you and you can get cool animations like this. I personally never got around to it, but there are ways to calibrate this process. You can actually get pretty good quantitative data about height coming from this type of technique. There's professional instruments that will do this exact process. <laughs> I don't remember what this was for, but it was an overly complicated XY flexure mechanism. I think it was designed to be 3D printed, which is why it's in a bunch of individual pieces that could be bolted together. And you can see there's sections that accept ball screw nuts. So it was supposed to be some type of ball screw driven XY flexure thing. <laughs> I don't know, but it is a cool mechanism. So. Here you are. I went through a phase where I was trying to grow KDP crystals, potassium dihydrogen phosphate. This is a type of non-linear crystal used in optics and lasers a lot. These crystals are used for frequency doubling or second harmonic generation. KDP is one that's relatively easy to do yourself because the individual components of the crystal are cheap, readily available, and safe. The actual process of growing a crystal is super easy. You know, it's an experiment you could do in a high school, but the process of growing an optically pure crystal, one that has like no defects and gives you a good crystal to work with optically is very challenging. The crystal likes to take up defects. So any metal ions that are inside of the solution will get incorporated into the crystal and cause a defect, which then grows outwards. Uh, it has to be kept at a very specific temperature. You need to make sure that the fluid is circulating around it. It's all kind of a big thing. I spent a good part of a summer trying to grow tungsten disulfide monolayers. This is a type of Van der Waals kind of 2D material similar to graphene. And there's various protocols for growing these monolayers yourself. This is one of those protocols that looks deceptively simple on the surface. So you take a source of tungsten, like tungsten trioxide, and a source of sulfur, like sulfur. You put them in a furnace and let the sulfur kind of volatilize and float downstream through the tube. It will interact with the tungsten trioxide and form tungsten disulfide on the surface of your substrate. At least that's how it's supposed to work. In practice, it's super, super finicky down to you know, where the sulfur and the tungsten are placed inside the tube furnace because they have different volatilization temperatures and, you know, 
the actual geometry of things inside the tube can block or inhibit the flow. Like it's a really complicated problem as it turns out. And I got tired of trying not to kill myself with hydrogen sulfide in my garage. So this one got shelved and I don't know if I will ever revisit this. I was in a tungsten disulfide kick at the time. I found this cool paper making van der Waals transistors on paper. And so the idea is that you can lay out contacts using like graphite or I sputtered on metals onto a piece of paper and then abrade tungsten disulfide or molybdenum disulfide, any of these kind of van der Waals materials and use that as the semiconductor for your transistor. I never actually got this to work, but I didn't try very hard. Uh, the paper is pretty straightforward. So if anyone's interested, I'd highly recommend you go read it and give it a shot yourself. Seems like it should be pretty straightforward. <laughs> this isn't a science project, but I found it when I was going through my photos. Uh, I made a kind of creepy stop motion at one point. I used a rigged face model in Blender to generate a sequence of facial expressions, exported each individual frame as a mesh, printed it on my SLA printer, gave it a quick primer and hand painting just to exaggerate the features a little bit, and made a rather creepy stop motion. In the liquid laser ablation video when I made the nanoparticles, I showed the Lycurgus cup, which was this glass cup made by the Romans and it incorporated silver and gold nanoparticles to give it really interesting optical properties. So I spent some time trying to replicate this and some of the properties seem pretty good, pretty close to what you'd expect from gold and silver nanoparticles. Honestly, I just got distracted and never got back to this, but definitely a promising project. Before I started working on the direct right laser lithography machine, I was actually working on just a more traditional projection lithography machine. It's a bunch of 3D printed components and aluminum extrusion. And the idea is that you have some type of mask at the top surface on that glass plate, and it's projected down through a series of lenses onto your substrate. Pretty straightforward. I never got this quite working because I got distracted by the direct right laser system and that ended up working first. So that's what the video was about. This was a silly project where I was trying to replicate a paper that generated a super hydrophobic coating. So a coating that doesn't like water. This was another one of those papers that had a deceptively simple protocol. You add an inert and very low surface energy additive into an electroplating solution. So for the paper, they used nickel as the electroplated metal and tungsten disulfide or Teflon, something like that, which is added in. The inert substance itself does an electroplate, but it'll be incorporated into the nickel as it plates out just kind of by accident. And if everything goes right, you get a surface that has very low surface energy and high roughness, which doesn't like water. So I tried this. I tried many variations of this. And the best I could get was a super hydrophilic surface, which loves water. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong here. I tried a bunch of variations. I looked at them under the SEM and they look a lot like the paper. So I don't know, there's some secret sauce here that I was missing and I just gave up out of frustration at some point. In the last couple of years, commercially available metal filled FDM filament has become available. Uh, these are some 17.4 stainless tests and I centered it in a vacuum furnace designed for like dental labs. If you cross section them, you can see that a lot of it didn't center well, but the core of this cube actually turned out pretty decent. Like it has a, a metallic sheen to it. And when we pop it under the SEM, we can see regions that have really good centering between the individual particles. What's neat about this is that as you move further to the outside of the, the sample, it becomes increasingly oxidized and you can actually see chromium oxide coming to the surface of the individual particles and making these really neat crystals. And of course the chromium oxide doesn't want to center to anything. And so it ends up protecting the individual particles and you get very poor centering on the exterior. Whereas the interior where presumably oxygen wasn't penetrating very far, it centered nicely. So this was a cool test, uh, lots of work to do. Clearly the vacuum it was pulling wasn't good enough. So there's still plenty of oxygen in the system ruining the centering, but it was a neat first test. Uh, <laughs> at some point, I filled my Avid CNC with polymer concrete. It now weighs about a thousand pounds, like actually about a thousand pounds. I used an old lathe base and bonded the router to that base and then filled all kind of the interstitial space with polymer concrete. So epoxy and 
gravel and sand and all that sort of stuff. I think I used urethane at some point too because I ran out of epoxy. I haven't actually run any tests with this yet, even though I did it maybe a year ago because I just haven't used my Avid a lot lately. But the thing's like a tank now, so it presumably will chatter a whole lot less than it did before. And finally, we come to this ultra fast sintering project. This was a paper that one of my patrons showed to me, and it's a really cool concept where you can sinter different types of ceramics like super, super quickly in seconds. And the way it works is that you use a carbon felt or carbon fibers and just run a ton of current through it, turning it into a big resistive heater. If you do this under a protective atmosphere like argon, you can get temperatures in excess of like 3000 degrees Celsius without burning out the carbon felt. And this will let you center different types of ceramics super quickly. I've been poking at this and my setup's not quite ideal, but I have gotten some results. It honestly just needs a bigger vacuum chamber, which luckily I now have, and a little better control over the power situation instead of just using a big variac like I'm doing here. Okay, cool. Well, that's all I got for you. Hopefully this was interesting. Just kind of a look at different projects I've worked on in the past. And I'll see y'all next time. Thanks for watching.